Hey everyone, welcome to part two of chapter 17. So as I said, in this part of the chapter, we're gonna basically just continue along the timeline. So picking up with um, now the baby has been born, so we have an infant and we'll talk about breastfeeding and we'll talk about some other aspects of this first year of life for the newborn human. Uh, so lactation, this is just kind of a definitions page. Uh, so lactation is just literally producing milk in the breast tissue, and obviously that milk is food and nourishment for the developing infant or child. Um, prolactin is a hormone, uh, and this is the hormone that actually stimulates the production of milk in the breast tissue. Um, oxytocin, I'm going to jump down here, oxytocin is another important lactation hormone um, it's often called the letdown hormone, so it's the hormone that actually brings the milk to the nipple so that when the baby, when the infant suckles on the nipple, um, oxytocin is the hormone that actually lets milk um, down and out so that the baby can consume it. And then <clears throat> within the breast milk itself, there's something called colostrum. I, within is kind of a wrong term to use, but colostrum is basically the very first milk that is ever produced after a baby is born. And it's some of the most nutrient rich milk that's going to come out. Um, all milk is going to be really nutrient rich, but this colostrum is full of proteins, full of antibodies, right, to help stimulate the, well, help get that infant immune system going, as well as different vitamins and minerals. It's also in the colostrum that we find some of those beneficial bacteria that will then go down and begin to populate and inhabit the infant's gastrointestinal tract. So colostrum is a really, really important component of uh, breast milk and a really important um, reason to breastfeed uh, right from go. <clears throat> uh, you don't necessarily need to know the anatomy at all, but this would be anatomy of breast tissue, right? So here's um, muscle tissue uh, in the chest. Here's fat tissue, so adipose cells around, like in the breast itself. And then you have milk ducts, uh, and you have these little alveoli, which are the glands that actually produce the milk. And then obviously we need oxytocin to actually get the milk down the duct and ultimately delivered to the nipple so that the infant can get the milk. Um, and so it is actually, there's this really nice feedback loop where the, the suckling by the infant actually stimulates the continued production of the prolactin and oxytocin hormones. So the infant suckles on the nipple and that literally causes nervous communication in, that, in the mother's body up to the hypothalamus in the brain. The hypothalamus then triggers the pituitary, which is the gland that makes um, prolactin to continue in making prolactin um, and oxytocin as well. So the suckling triggers the brain to tell the pituitary gland, hey, continue with your production of prolactin and oxytocin. So really nice uh, positive feedback loop so that as the infant is suckling, the breast tissue continues to produce milk and continues to make it available to the child. Um, so what are some of the nutrient needs of the female or of the, the mother of the breastfeeding person uh, during this time? So milk production requires about 700 or, or it, I guess I should say, a, a female body will use about 700 to 800 calories a day just to produce milk. So that's quite a lot of calories just going into milk production. Um, but remember at this point, this is post delivery now. So the pregnant person is, you know, maybe 20, 25 pounds overweight at this point. Um, so there's already some extra calories on the body that can help contribute to this milk production. So milk production uses seven to 800 calories a day. But again, because we're also gonna to wanna to be seeing some weight loss in this period, losing some of that baby weight, as it's commonly called, I guess, um, a lactating person actually only needs to consume an additional 300 to 400 calories per day um, above what they were consuming before pregnancy. 
So that's actually very similar to what we saw in that second and third trimester when the baby was growing. It's maybe a small, one additional small meal or two additional small snacks during the day should still be coming from healthful foods. And so in this way, the body is still working quite a bit to produce milk. So there's this increased energy expenditure. And we're, you know, the pregnant, excuse me, the lactating person is going to still have a slightly increased energy intake, but it's going to be negative energy intake so that there can be this gradual um, weight loss of one pound a month or even potentially upwards to like one pound a week. Um, there are still increased nutrient needs for the pregnant person at this time, particularly same thing from protein, carbohydrates, DHA, that essential omega-3 fatty acid, uh, vitamins, minerals, and fluid intake. Um, supplements, again, if a person is supplementing during lactation, that should only be in addition to a healthful diet. It should not take the place of a healthful diet. So this is not a time to, again, be having you know Whoppers and Big Macs, but taking a supplement. No, this is a time to follow a really, really healthful diet to make sure that the infant is getting all that it needs through the breast milk and to make sure that the lactating person is in as good of health as they can be in. Uh, so here's one of these like food comparison charts, just showing you low nutrient density on the left side versus high nutrient density on the right side. Both are going to give that like increase 300 to 400 calories a day, um, but obviously the right side is going to be significantly healthier, right? So what are some of the changes? Instead of instead of a bagel with cream cheese, having you know two slices of a whole grain toast with peanut butter and jam, an apple. Um, I wouldn't recommend cereal, but <laughs> I guess cereal maybe a nice bowl of oatmeal with some berries would be good. Um, you know, only one cup of coffee, maybe black coffee would be better than having the additional fat, the additional saturated fat at lunchtime. So instead of like a classic United Statesian lunch of a hot dog and French fries and pretzels, having a really great, uh, well-rounded salad, having a couple of eggs, um, having a side of like a lentil soup. Um, <clears throat> Water would be good too. Uh, let's put a water cup. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't include water here. Um, and then at dinner, right, instead of, I mean, the one on the left isn't horrible, but it might not even be enough, right? And there's a lot of sugar coming from the soda, a lot of sugar from the brownies. So on the right side, we just add a little more diversity. We add a lot more fiber also by the whole greens and the legumes and the broccoli. Hopefully, even just by looking, hopefully you can see this has a lot more fiber than this one. Um, and then the dessert too, also gonna be more fiber rich by having like whole piece of chocolate, but really the strawberries is where the fiber comes from. Um, water again, I'll draw the water cup. Um, and then you can kind of, we can browse the micronutrients as well. So this is higher in folate. It's obviously higher in fiber. It's also higher in protein. It's much higher in vitamin C from all of the fruits and vegetables, right? That's really the only place we get vitamin C is fruits and vegetables. Um, much higher in calcium, much higher in calcium, well, much higher in zinc, and much lower in sodium. So hopefully this is pretty straightforward. I mean, this is kind of the crux of the class, is like understanding the, the difference between low nutrient density and high nutrient density. And hopefully you've kind of observed throughout this course that every time we see one of these comparison charts, nutrient density is what makes a meal healthier. Right? So that's, I think, one of the most important changes any single individual can make to improve, to improve their nutritional health is to just eat more nutrient-dense foods, which basically means eat more fruits and vegetables, eat fewer processed foods like pretzels, hot dogs, and french fries, um, eat more whole grains and legumes, and drink more water. Okay, so what are some of the advantages to breastfeeding? Uh, there are many. Um, I think we're going to go through each and every single one of these on a separate slide. Uh, no, we're not. Okay, so we'll go through each of them now. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, some of these, I guess, my bad. I thought I had listed these all out. 
So breastfeeding, um, it can be the best nutrition. It really can be the best source of nutrition for the infant. Um, this, of course, goes with, let me go back here. If a pregnant, excuse me, we're lactating now. If a lactating person is eating this nutrient-dense diet, absolutely without question, that's going to that's gonna translate into very nutrient-rich breast milk. So that's going to be excellent food for the baby. Um, the forms of some of the nutrients are already in their most absorbable form. So it's easy for the baby to absorb and assimilate into their body. Again, you get the antibodies. You cannot replicate antibodies in formula. So you get antibodies which prevent allergies and infections. So again, immediate you know, substance to the infant's immune system. It assists with weight loss for the, for the mother. Um, it also suppresses ovulation, which is really important. So it means that the mother can't get pregnant again um, too quickly, um, especially if it's actually breastfeeding and not pumping and then bottle feeding. It really stimulates mother-infant bonding. And obviously there are some scenarios where breastfeeding, it just isn't happening for some reason. And so the best a person can do is to pump and bottle feed. And they can still in that case, you know, hold the infant and feed the bottle itself. Um, but there's just so much sensory um, development going on in the skin-to-skin -skin contact that can happen with breastfeeding. It's really um, quite powerful for sensory development and, again, cognitive and emotional development. Um, of course, in, in, I, I guess by many perspectives, it's, it's convenient um, and it's cost-effective. Certainly by some perspectives, it's not convenient, but um, uh, that could be an advantage. So then, of course, there are challenges to breastfeeding as well. Um, certainly, as I just said, it's convenient. I think depending on the context, it may really not be convenient whatsoever. And in fact, having a, having pumped and giving a bottle of, of your own milk is much more convenient depending on the context. Um, it's also not necessarily straightforward and intuitive. So it can require practice. It can be, there's some learning involved, and so it certainly requires a good deal of patience. Again, it may even be stressful to uh, you know, a mother who is struggling to produce milk or maybe not making enough oxytocin for whatever reason. Um, also, certainly if this is the diet of the mother, or if there's drugs or alcohol coming in, then definitely we don't want that breast milk going to the infant. So any sort of harmful, harmful substances that are in the, the pregnant, sorry, in the lactating person's body, those are going to make their way into the infant and can be very dangerous. So breastfeeding is really only so beneficial if the pregnant, <laughs> if the lactating person is healthy. Um, HIV is also transmitted through breast milk. So, so if it's an HIV positive person, then you may want to, in fact, uh, use formula. Um, also, one of the things that might cause complications with breastfeeding is maternal obesity. So that can obviously make it more challenging. And then again, depending on the person's employment, like if they actually have time off to breastfeed, you know, whenever the infant's hungry, um, or if they have the time to go, you know, into a private place and pump, uh, or if they don't have those liberties, depending on their place of employment. So. All of these things, kind of a short list, I guess, on both sides of the advantages and challenges to breastfeeding. Okay, doke. So then we'll, I think we'll spend the rest of this lecture talking about the infant nutrition. So uh, during infancy, we're basically talking about birth through the first year of life. Uh, so of course, I mean, we could say this statement at any point in the lifespan that optimal nutrition is important, but certainly it's really important at this point as it was during gestation because this sort of sets the stage for this person's life. So a, a lot of things, nutritional deficits or excesses that happen in infancy can certainly continue to affect the person throughout their lifetime. So we see that organs are still very much developing as well as the nervous system. Um, one of the ways to track infant growth is using growth charts. There are, are several different types. So you can look at length for age, weight for age, weight for length, and also head circumference because there can be quite a bit of um, brain development going on in this first year of life. 
So one of the important things we're looking for using growth charts is consistency over time. Growth charts certainly come with their own limitations, um, but they're a good starting place at least. Uh, so what kind of patterns might we look for? Uh, so in the first year, an infant, a healthy infant would grow about 10 inches in length and roughly triple their weight. So again, that's going to be based on the weight that they were born at. Um, energy needs are, of course, very high because there's a lot of physical growth. And of course, there's a lot of like internal work going on. So there's a really high basal metabolic rate for an infant. Um, also, energy needs are high, too, because there's quite a bit of body heat loss because there's a pretty large surface area um, for the baby as it grows. Again, consistency over time is important. Um, and certainly not all babies are going to grow to the same length, to the same weight, you know, at every chunk, you know, at every mark in the age, in the age span. So that's one of the greatest limitations is that a baby may be growing perfectly well, um, but they might be slightly off from the growth chart. So again, just like with BMI, they're a good reference, but they're not like the end all be all. Um, so what is some of this energy expenditure that we see in the infant? I guess we kind of just mentioned it before, but kind of interesting to break it down in the first six months to the second six months in that first year of life. So the first six months, there's a lot of physical, gro uh, physical growth, right? Um, certainly not a ton of physical activity. Um, and then, as we said, a lot of metabolic reactions as the organs are developing, more tissue is developing. There's just a lot of metabolic action. So this is, again, basal metabolic rate. And interestingly, by the end of the, oh, sorry, by the second six months in that first year, growth slows down a little bit. Physical activity starts to increase a little bit. And of course, the basal metabolic activity is still quite high. Um, nutrient needs, so some things to consider. There's really high energy per unit of body weight, uh, like high energy output. So therefore, there's high energy needs. So they need a lot of calories coming in. But also consider that they are very small. So it's still not a lot per se relative to what an adult would consume. Um, and also their digestive tracts are immature. Everything is very immature and still developing. So of course, we have to be um, thoughtful and careful with what types of foods we introduce uh, towards the end of the first year. Um, breaking it down into the actual nutrients. So a really important note with infants is that their total fat requirement is quite high. Almost 50% of all of the energy coming into an infant's body should actually be fat. Uh, what's nice is that this is already the case with breast milk, right? Breast milk is already about 50% fat. Um, so any infant formula should also be made the same way. Um, also, it's not just any fat, but specifically our essential fatty acids. So arachidonic acid and docosahexaenoic acid are important for brain growth. Again, maturation of the eye and the nervous system. Um, protein is not super high, but it's also not low. So it's you know roughly 20% of total energy comes from protein. And then that remaining like 30% comes from carbohydrates. I think this, I pulled this quote right out of your textbook. Infants are not small versions of adults, meaning the proportions of the macronutrients that they require do differ from adult proportions. That's why what you're seeing right here is not the AMDR that we saw for adults, right? The AMDR for fat for adults is like 20 to 35%, right? And for protein, um, it's 10 to 35%. Uh, so very different macronutrient needs for the developing infant. Um, and total calorie needs could be calculated uh, using this equation, roughly 40 to 50 calories per pound of body weight per day for total calories. Um, certainly high need for some of these same nutrients that we saw during pregnancy, as the blood, as the nervous system is developing, as the brain is developing, as the bones are developing. Also remember, vitamin K is something that um, can be made by bacteria living in the intestines, but an infant is not going to house these bacteria 
right from go. So it's common that an infant would receive a vitamin K injection or even several of them uh, in that first year of life to start, you know, to kind of to give them preformed vitamin K. Um, and then fluid intake is really critical, of course, too. So fluids should be at roughly two ounces uh, per pound of body weight per day. Remember, breast milk is already kind of the perfect food. You don't necessarily even need to think about it too hard. Um, again, if the pregnant person, sorry, if the lactating person is healthy, then again, a, a good infant formula should also be a good source of fluid. Really important to avoid intake of high sugar whatsoever, but especially sugary liquids, fruit juices, and other sweetened beverages. And this is for the infant themselves. So the best sources of fluid would be the breast milk or formula, and maybe very small amounts of water. Um, but certainly it is not recommended, this says avoid, <laughs> it is not recommended to be introducing basically sugary beverages during infancy. Um, one of the main reasons is it can lead to tooth decay, but the other main reason is it can lead to overweight and obesity. And the earlier in life that a person becomes overweight or obese, the harder it is to change that. A few notes on infant formula. So um, there are a few things that infant formulas just will never be able to replace um, in comparison to the mother's breast milk. So immune factors, certain enzymes, the antibodies, these are some of the unique components of human milk that just literally cannot be replicated in infant formula. So a baby taking only infant formula is not going to get these same sort of immune enhancing um, compounds. Um, Soy-based formulas, so for, any, for anyone, if the infant can't take breast milk for any reason or if the mother can't produce breast milk, soy-based formulas do seem to be very safe. Um, there are also obviously cow milk based formulas too. Um, and there are some formulas also uh, formulated for various medical conditions as needed. Uh, I could put this on the previous slide with, um, you know, avoiding sugary beverages. Also, it's actually really important to avoid straight cow's milk in that first year of life. Um, cow's milk formulas the milk has already been changed quite a bit so that it's not so high in protein and it's easier for the baby to digest. But straight cow's milk out of the jug is not a good food for an infant. It has way too much protein for the infant. It's also really hard for the infant to digest and it may contribute to gastrointestinal bleeding, which obviously would be very dangerous for an infant. Um, so it's not until after the first year of life that cow's milk would be introduced. Um, I'm not really going to go over this slide, but you can read this section in your book too if you're interested, just the, the labeling for infant formulas. It's obviously a little bit different and obviously the nutrition facts panel looks a bit different than what we saw for uh, foods <laughs> that, that adults eat, but kind of similar. You can see obviously the different macronutrients and micronutrients and you can see the full ingredients list. So obviously this is a formula. This is replacing milk, um, a mother's breast milk. So you'll see it's quite loaded with all the different micronutrients that the baby would need. And so then when to start solid foods? Um, so this would typically be around six months, but this is just introducing. Um, so they would be considered complementary to the breast milk still at this point. This is not suggesting to wean from the breast milk at six months. Um, this is important in particular because it's around six months that the iron stores in the infant's liver are gonna start to decline. And obviously the infant is still growing. So um, the breast milk may not, it's still gonna provide the base, the majority of the nutrition for the infant. Um, but obviously the infant's not going to breastfeed forever. So good to start introducing solid foods and just beginning to make that transition um, to solid foods. Um, also, the extrusion, the extrusion reflex. So that's that like when a baby is suckling on the nipple, there's a certain like motion that it's making with its tongue to like 
and with its lips actually suck the milk out of the nipple. And that's when, <laughs> when we then try to introduce solid foods, um, if that extrusion reflex is still going on, that's why the baby can spit up quite a bit because it's not like, obviously we don't eat food the same way we might suckle on a, on a nipple. And so um, the extrusion reflex starts to lessen at about four to five months. So that's why around six months of time, six months of age, that's a good time to start introducing solid foods. Um, so obviously some other important pieces to consider, the baby needs to have you know, at least some muscular control of its own head and neck, and it must be able to sit up so that it doesn't choke. And so none of that's happening earlier than six months. Also, we need to wait um, because, again, we want the digestive system and the kidneys to be mature enough to handle solid foods. I think this is a super helpful chart. Um, just some guidelines around introducing solid foods. So always recommended to start with single items, um, just one at a time and doing them in like, a, a, you know, three to five days at a time and then moving on to another food. This is important because it makes it easy to identify potential food allergies. Um, also important to start with foods that are gonna provide key nutrients such as iron fortified um, cereal, again, that's just one type of grain or a pureed meat. Um, again, iron and zinc are the most common nutrient deficiencies in infants, so it's important to start introducing those through food, you know, at some point in that first year, in the second half of that first year. Um, again, do not introduce fruit juices in the first year. Do not introduce cow's milk in the first year. And by the age of one, so by the end of that first year, it's important to have introduced a variety of different foods. Um, this is important to improve overall nutrient intake. It's also really important because it stimulates the sense of taste and smell and texture. Um, and so this can be a really positive um, starting place for developing healthy eating habits down the road as the child matures. What not to feed? So again, nothing super sweet, no other animals milk, and this is again in the first year of life. No fruit juices, nothing too salty or too sweet, um, and not too much of anything, right? Not too much breast milk or too much formula. Uh, so some nutrition related concerns of the infant. So these we will go through in each, uh, each of these we'll go through. So food allergies, um, you know, obviously it's an allergic reaction to a certain type of food. The most common are an allergy to cow's milk protein, um, and that can even come about from cow's milk-based formulas. Um, peanuts, egg whites, soy, tree nuts, shellfish, and wheat. Those are our most common allergens. Again, breastfeeding reduces the risk of allergic development because breastfeeding provides a lot of those enzymes um, and immu immunomodulatory components to the developing immune system so that as you start to introduce some foods, the baby can tolerate them. Um, again, delay introducing solid foods until at least six months, even a little later if you feel more comfortable. And again, introduce foods in isolation so you can identify an allergic reaction. And things to look for would be GI distress, like diarrhea or vomiting, skin, um, showing signs in the skin like rashes or hives, um, a runny nose or sneezing, and difficulty breathing. These are all can be signs of an allergic reaction. Colic is another thing to watch out for. This is basically like these relentless crying spells that seem to come out of nowhere and seem to be really hard to console. Um, Oftentimes the precise cause is not necessarily known. Some things to check for could be, you know, is the nervous system overstimulated, too much sensory input? Uh, did they consume a food too rapidly or a breast milk too rapidly? Maybe they swallowed some air and they just need to like burp, right, and gas. Or maybe they do have some gas in their intestinal tract and that's causing discomfort. Um, so any of these could be addressed, right, if there's overstimulation of the nervous system, try to reduce whatever those stimulants are or take them away, slow down the feeding, 
uh, help the baby to burp. If it's based on a, an offending food in the mother's diet that's coming through the breast milk, see if that can be identified. Um, you know, if you're doing formula foods, you maybe try a different type of formula, see if that's what the cause is. Um, so you can definitely do some, some investigation to see if you can understand why the baby's crying and obviously try to address that root cause. And then GERD, so the infant can experience GERD, right? The regurgitation of the stomach contents into the esophagus often results in spitting up. This is more common in preterm infants. Um, really important to keep the infant upright after feeding. So definitely don't feed the infant and then put it down. Um, avoid overfeeding too is a really good thing to do and check for choking or gagging. And then failure to thrive. So failure to thrive is, um, I guess, interesting. Uh, this would basically be where the growth basically plateaus or even starts to decline um, for lack of much apparent reason. So weight would be obviously below the third percentile, so quite low. Um, you, we would eventually see stunting too, which is that low height for age. We saw that when we talked a little more about malnutrition and undernutrition. So stunting comes from acute undernutrition. Um, and then wasting would ultimately come about, which is that extremely low weight for height. And obviously that goes hand in hand with chronic undernutrition. So there are some more like systemic factors that can lead to failure to thrive. Certainly if the family is living in poverty, if there's inadequate knowledge about how to care for the infant, how to feed the infant. Um, your book puts in their extreme nutritional beliefs. So potentially if like, you know, certain foods or ways of eating are being restricted and the infant's not getting enough nutrition. Um, sometimes social isolation, either of the child itself or of the mother and child can cause that. Certainly issues of domestic violence or substance abuse can lead to undernourishment of the infant. Um, and of course, failure to thrive, if it's not um, addressed in a, right away, it can certainly lead to developmental, motor, and cognitive delays. And then anemia, so again, this sort of lacking um, healthy blood. Um, so remember we said that full-term infants, so babies who've gone through the full 38 to 42 weeks of gestation, are born with enough iron in their liver to last them about six months. So if, if at six months, iron-rich foods are not introduced in small amounts, this can lead to iron deficiency anemia, or it could lead to pallor, like a really uh, like pale, I guess, skin color. <clears throat> so kind of lacking that nice like vibrancy and that almost reddish color that we get or a pinkish color that we get from having healthy blood flow. Also lethargy, right? Some of the same symptoms we saw with iron deficiency anemia in adults um, and certainly impaired growth. So again, at about six months, begin to introduce iron rich foods, whether that's um, an iron fortified formula or a, you know, a singular rice or other grain cereal or pureed meats. Um, and remember uh, to avoid cow's milk, Interestingly, actually in the United States, um, one of the common causes of anemia uh, in the United States for infants and children is overconsumption of cow's milk. Um, and that's because it then takes the place of something that would have otherwise been iron rich. So uh, really interesting, I guess, to watch out for that. Do not <laughs> feed cow's milk prior to one year of life. Dehydration certainly can come about. Uh, this can be really dangerous. We saw that dehydration can be dangerous in adults, so it can certainly be dangerous in infants too. Um, dehydration can be caused by diarrhea and vomiting or prolonged fever, right? Anything that's causing extra fluid wasting or like loss of fluid. And of course, not getting enough fluid can also be part of the cause too. So treatment, provide fluids for sure. Um, resume breastfeeding if, if it was discontinued for any reason. And depending on the severity, uh, an electrolyte replacement, so a specific pediatric electrolyte replacement solution may be recommended for a short period of time to help 
rehydrate and replenish the electrolyte supply. Um, and then some feeding challenges. So kind of, again, just introducing the concept here, but um, some infants are born with a cleft lip or a cleft palate, uh, various metabolic disorders, and various, um, again, cognitive and, and even physical delays. So in any of these cases, um, there's not you know, a straightforward solution, but certainly working with the pediatrician and potentially even like a pediatric dietitian to develop, you know, to understand what's going on and, and to develop an individualized feeding plan for that particular infant would be the best way to go. Lead poisoning. So um, lead exposure can come from old lead-based paints. Um, or old uh, lead-based pipes. Um, so this can be really toxic to infants, um, especially to their brain and nervous system. So it can result in decreased mental capacity, behavioral problems, um, and even anemia-impaired growth. So how to reduce lead exposure uh, if, you know, if living in a household that does have lead pipes, still old lead pipes, before consuming any of the water or using any of the water from the pipes, let the tap water, water run for at least 60 seconds before using the water. Um, also use only cold tap water for drinking and cooking and infant formula preparation because the, hot, the hotter the water, the more likely it is to leach the lead out of the pipe. And then if there's any lead-based paint in the house, um, you know, have that professionally removed. And then nursing bottle syndrome. So this is again really, um, Kind of related to, well, it can be. It doesn't matter what's in the in the bottle, but this relates back to um, taking in too much high sugar beverages. So the issue is that it can lead to um, issues in the gums and the teeth. So nursing nursing bottle syndrome is basically prolonged exposure of the teeth. So the teeth are exposed to for a long period of time really sweet fluids. So again, that could be infant formula, that could even be breast milk. Um, and of course, if someone had given a, a, you know, a juice or a, a sugar sweetened beverage, um, it could be from that too. And so what happens is if the, you know, the infant is left al alone with the bottle and maybe they're just slowly suckling on it, so there's this slow drip of this super sweet liquid onto their teeth, it can cause tooth decay right, in those little developing teeth. Um, so again, it is, the, it is literally the sugars themselves that actually feed bacteria that live in our mouths. And this is the same way cavities form in adults too. Um, so the bacteria feed on these sugars and in that process of fermenting these sugars, it actually de decays the teeth a little bit and can cause cavities. Uh, so some things that we can do um, by eight months old, you know, start introducing use of a cup so that they can't just sit there and have the fluid dripping onto their teeth. Certainly by 18 months, so just shy of two years, try to, or, you know, about a year and a half, actually, try to wean from the bottle altogether. And then um, while the infant is still using a bottle, clean their gums after you know, after they feed, just gently wiping them with a washcloth would be enough. So it's really trying to get that, not trying hard, right, but just like a really gentle wipe, but to get the excess sugar off the teeth and off the gums. Oh, I didn't realize we end with nursing bottle syndrome. Okay, well, um, yeah, this part two is definitely going to be shorter, but um, that's all that we're going to say here to, up to infancy, but we'll pick right up at this stage in chapter 18, and we'll talk about that second year of life and toddlerhood and childhood and adolescence. So 18, chapter 18 will also be a pretty um, dense lecture too. Okay, uh, thanks for listening. As always, I will scroll through the um, review questions. So take these at your own time and just practice and kind of, you know, thumb back through and understand why you might have gotten any of the questions wrong or also go back through and make sure you understand why it's correct. Um, and as always, email me if you have any questions. So thank you all for listening, and we will see you next time for Chapter 18.